The Scaletta, Chapter 11, The Interior of a Heart. After the incident last described, the intercourse between the clergyman and the physician, though externally the same, was really of another character than it had previously been. The intellect of Roger Chillingworth had now a sufficiently plain path before it. It was not indeed precisely that which he had laid out for himself to tread, calm, gentle, passionless as he appeared. There was yet, we fear, a quiet depth of malice, hitherto latent but active now, in this unfortunate old man, which led him to imagine a more intimate revenge than any mortal had ever wreaked upon an enemy, to make himself the one trusted friend to whom should be confided all the fear, the remorse, the agony, the ineffectual repentance, the backward rush of sinful thoughts expelled in vain, all that guilty sorrow hidden from the world whose great heart would have pitied and forgiven to be revealed to him the pitiless, to him the unforgiving, all that dark treasure to be lavished on the very man to whom nothing else could so adequately pay the debt of vengeance. The clergyman's shy and sensitive reserve had balked the scheme. Roger Chillingworth, however, was inclined to be hardly, if at all, less satisfied with the aspects of affairs which Providence, using the avenger and his victim for its own purposes, and perchance pardoning where it, it seemed most to punish, had substituted for his black devices. A revelation, he could almost say, had been granted to him. It mattered little for his object, whether celestial or from what other region. By its aid, in all the subsequent relations betwixt him and Mr. Dimsdale, not merely the external presence, but the very inmost soul of the latter seemed to be brought out before his eyes, so that he could see and comprehend its every movement. He became thenceforth not a spectator only, but a chief actor in the poor minister's interior world. He could play upon him as he chose. Would he arouse him with the throb of agony? The victim was forever on the rack. It needed only to know with a spring that controlled the engine, and the physician knew it well. Would he startle him with sudden fear? As at the waving of a magician's wand uprose a grisly phantom, uprose a thousand phantoms, in many shapes of death, the more awful shame, all flocking around about the clergyman and pointing with their fingers at his breast. All this was accomplished with a subtlety so perfect that the minister, though he had constantly a dim perception of some evil influence watching over him, could never gain a knowledge of its actual nature. True, he looked doubtfully, fearfully, even at times with horror and the bitterness of hatred at the deformed figure of the old physician. His gestures, his gait, his grizzled beard, his slightest and most indifferent acts, the very fashion of his garments were odious in the clergyman's sight. A token implicitly to be relied on of a deeper antipathy in the beast's breast of the latter than he was willing to acknowledge to himself. For as it was impossible to assign a reason for such distrust and abhorrence, so Mr. Dimsdale, conscious that the poison of one morbid spot was infecting his heart's entire substance, attributed all his presentiments to no other cause. He took himself to task for his bad sympathies in reference to Roger Chillingworth, disregarded the lesson that he should have drawn from them, and did his best to root them out. Unable to accomplish this, he nevertheless, as a matter of principle, continued his habits of social familiarity with the old man, and thus gave him constant opportunities for perfecting the purpose to which, forlorn, forlorn, poor forlorn creature that he was, and more wretched than his victim, the avenger, had devoted himself. While thus suffering under bodily disease, and gnawed and tortured by some black trouble of the soul, and given over to the machinations of his deadliest enemy, the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale had achieved a brilliant popularity in his sacred office. He won it indeed in great part by his sorrows. His intellectual gifts, his moral perceptions, his power of experiencing and communicating emotion were kept in a state of preternatural activity by the prick and anguish of his daily life. His fame, though still on its upward slope, already overshadowed the sober reputations of his fellow clergymen, eminent as several of them were. There were scholars among them who had spent more years in acquiring abstruse lore connected with the divine profession than Mr. Dimsdale had lived, and who might well, therefore, be more profoundly versed in such solid and valuable attainments than their youthful brother. There were men, too, of a sturdier texture of mind than his, and endowed with a far greater share of shrewd, hard, iron, or granite understanding, which duly mingled with a fair proportion of doctrinal ingredient, constitutes a highly respectable, efficacious, and an amiable variety of the clerical species. There were others, again, true saintly fathers, whose faculties had been elaborated by weary toil among their books and by patient thought, and etherealized, moreover, by spiritual communications with the better world, into which their purity of life 
had almost introduced these holy personages with their garments of mortality still clinging to them. All that they lacked was the gift that descended upon the chosen disciples at Pentecost in tongues of flame, symbolizing, it would seem, not the power of speech in foreign and unknown languages, but that of addressing the whole human brotherhood in the heart's native language. These fathers, otherwise so apostolic, lacked heaven's last and rarest attestation of their office, the tongue of flame. They would have vainly sought, had they ever dreamed of seeking, to express the highest truth through the humblest medium of familiar words and images. Their voices came down afar and indistinctly from the upper heights where they habitually dwelt. Not improbably, it was to this latter class of men that Mr. Dimsdale, by his many traits of character, naturally belonged. To their high mountain peaks of faith and sanctity he would have climbed had not the tendency been thwarted by the burden, whatever it might be, of crime and anguish beneath which it was his doom to totter. It kept him down on a level with the lowest, him, the man of ethereal attributes, whose voice the angels might else have listened to and answered. But this very burden it was that gave him sympathy so intimate with the sinful brotherhood of mankind, so that his heart vibrated in unison with theirs, and received their pain into itself, and sent its own throb of pain through a thousand other hearts in gushes of sad, persuasive eloquence. Often persuasive, but sometimes terrible. The people knew not the power that moved them thus. They deemed the young clergyman a miracle of holiness. They fancied him the mouthpiece of heaven's messages of wisdom and rebuke and love. In their eyes, the very ground on which he trod was sanctified. The virgins of his church grew pale around him, victims of a passion so imbued with religious sentiment that they imagined it to be all religion, and brought it openly in their white bosoms as their most acceptable sacrifice before the altar. The aged members of his flock, beholding Mr. Dimsdale's frame so feeble, while they were themselves so rugged in their infirmity, believed that he would go to heavenward before them, and enjoined it upon their children that their old bones should be buried close to their young pastor's holy grave. And all this time, perchance, when poor Mr. Dimsdale was thinking of his grave, he questioned with himself whether the grass would ever grow on it, because an accursed thing must there be buried. It is inconceivable the agony with which this public veneration tortured him. It was his genuine impulse to adore the truth and to reckon all things shadow-like and utterly devoid of weight or value that had not its divine essence as the life within their life. Then what was he, a substance or the dimmest of all shadows? He longed to speak out from his own pulpit at the full height of his voice and tell the people what he was. I whom you behold in these black garments of the priesthood, I who ascended the sacred desk and turned my pale face heavenward, taking upon himself to hold communion in your behalf with the most high omniscience, I in whose daily life you discern the sanctity of Enoch, I whose footsteps, as you suppose, leave a gleam along my earthly track, whereby the pilgrims that shall come after me may be guided to the regions of the blessed, I who have laid the hands of baptism upon your children, I who have breathed the parting prayer over your dying friends, to whom the amen sounded faintly from a world which they had quitted, I your pastor, whom you so reverence and trust, am utterly a pollution and a lie. More than once, Mr. Dimsdale had gone into the pulpit with a purpose never to come down at steps till he should have spoken words like the above. More than once he had cleared his throat and drawn in the long deep breath and tremulous breath, which, when sent forth again, would come burdened with the black secret of his soul. More than once, nay, more than a hundred times, he had actually spoken. Spoken, but how? He had told his hearers that he was altogether vile, a viler companion of the vilest, the worst of sinners, an abomination, a thing of unimaginable iniquity, and that the only wonder was that they did not see his wretched, wretched body shriveled up before their eyes by the burning wrath of the Almighty. Could there be plainer speech than this? Would not the people start up in their seats by a simultaneous impulse and tear him down out of the pulpit which he defiled? Not so indeed. They heard it all and did but reverence him the more. They little guessed what deadly purport lurked in those, lurked in those self-condemning words. The godly youth, said they among themselves, the saint on earth. Alas, if he discerned such sinfulness in his own white soul, what horrid spectacle would he behold in thine or mine? The minister well knew, subtle but remorseful hypocrite that he was, the light in which his vague confession would be viewed. He had striven to put a cheat upon himself by making the avowal of a guilty conscience, but had only gained one other sin and a self-acknowledged shame without the momentary relief of being self-deceived. He had spoken the very truth and transformed it into the veriest falsehood, and yet 
By the constitution of his nature, he loved the truth and loathed the lie as few men ever did. Therefore, above all things, he loathed his miserable self. His inward trouble drove him to practices more in accordance with the old, corrupted faith of Rome than with the better light of the church in which he had been born and bred. In Mr. Dimsdale's secret closet under lock and key, there was a bloody scourge. Oftentimes, this Protestant and Puritan divine had plied it on his own shoulders, laughing bitterly at himself the while and smiting so much the more piteously because of that bitter laugh. It was his custom, too, as it had been that of many other pious Puritans, to fast, not, however, like them, in order to purify the body and render it the fitter medium of celestial illumination, but rigorously and until his knees trembled beneath him as an act of penance. He kept vigils likewise, night after night, sometimes in utter darkness, sometimes with a glimmering lamp, and sometimes viewing his own face in a looking-glass by the most powerful light which he could throw upon it. He thus typified the constant introspection wherewith he tortured but could not purify himself. In these lengthened vigils, his brain often reeled and vision seemed to flit before them, perhaps seen doubtfully and by a faint light of their own, in the remoteness dim, remote dimness of the chamber or more vividly and close beside him within the looking glass. Now it was a herd of diabolic shapes that grinned and mocked at the pale minister and beckoned him away with them. Now a group of shining angels who flew upward heavily as sorrow-laden, but grew more ethereal as they rose. Now came the dead friends of his youth and his white-bearded father with a saint-like frown and his mother turning her face away as she passed by. Ghost of a mother, thinnest fantasy of a mother, methinks she might yet have thrown a pitying glance towards her son. And now through the chamber which these spectral thoughts had made so ghastly glided Hester Prynne leading along little Pearl in her scarlet garb and pointing her forefinger first at the scarlet letter on her bosom and then at the clergyman's own breast. None of these visions ever quite deluded him. At any moment, by an effort of his will, he could discern substances through their misty lack of substance and convince himself that they were not solid in their nature, like yonder table of carved oak or that big square leathern-bound and brazen-clasped volume of divinity. But for all that, they were in one sense the truest and most substantial things which the poor minister now dealt with. It is the unspeakable misery of a life so false as his that it steals the pith and substance out of whatever realities there are around us, and which were meant by heaven to be the Spirit's joy and nutriment. To the untrue man the whole universe is false, it is impalpable, it shrinks to nothing within his grasp, and he himself, in so far as he shows himself in a false light, becomes a shadow, or indeed ceases to exist. The only truth that continued to give Mr. Dimsdale a real existence on this earth was the anguish in his inmost soul and the undissembled expression of it in his aspect. Had he once found power to smile and wear a face of gaiety, there would have been no such man. Or, on one of those ugly nights which he had, we had faintly hinted at, but forborne to picture forth, the minister started from his chair. A new thought had struck him. There might be a moment's peace in it. Attiring himself with as much care as if it had been for public worship, and precisely in the same manner, he stole softly down the staircase, undid the door, and issued forth.